Ladies and gentlemen, good day and welcome to Marico Limited Q4 FI23 earnings conference call. We have with us the senior management of Marico, represented by Mr. Sogata Gupta, MD and CEO, and Mr. Pavan Agarwal, CFO. As a reminder, all participant lines will be in the listen-only mode. There will be an opportunity for you to ask questions after the presentation concludes. Should you need assistance during the conference call, please signal an operator by pressing star then zero on your touchstone phone. Please note that this conference is being recorded. Before we get started, I would like to remind you that the Q&A session is only for institutional investors and analysts. And therefore, if there is anybody else who is not an institutional investor or analyst, but would like to ask questions, please directly reach out to Marico's investor relations team. I now hand the conference over to Mr. Sogata Gupta for his opening comments. Thank you, and over to you, sir. Yeah, hi, uh, everyone, and good evening to all those who have joined the call, and hope all of you are doing fine. As FY23 has come to a close, I would like to reflect on the operating environment during the year and the quarter gone by, after which I shall touch upon our performance. <laughs> Uh, FY23 started with escalating geopolitical tensions uh, in Ukraine, leading to steep inflation and interest rate hikes globally. In India, this led to climbing food and retail inflation, which adversely affected the overall consumption sentiment. However, over the course of the last six to nine months, there has been moderation in key commodity prices and retail inflation levels, which has most likely brought about a, a gradual recovery in FMCG consumption. Looking at FMCG volume trends in this period, we believe the prospects of a sustained recovery have strengthened. After five quarters of volume decline, the sector has posted volume growth. Urban consumption has been steady, while rural is also showing some convincing signs of having bottomed out. Foods continues to drive growth for the sector, while HPC has also entered positive territory after an extended slowdown. As we move forward into the next year, we believe that subject to a near normal monsoon prediction, the certainty of a moderating retail inflation and less volatility in food prices bodes well for a sustained reversal in the sector. Coming on how we fared in Q4, we are continuing to see a sequential uptick in domestic volume growth and robust growth in our international business. If you look at our performance from a medium term lens, we have delivered a 6% domestic volume growth on a four year CADR basis, while sector volumes have grown between 2 and 3% correspondingly. Similar, even in our international business, has delivered 11% constant currency growth on a four-year CAGR basis, and in the last nine, 10 quarters, has been consistently delivering double digit except one quarter, which there are 9%. In terms of profitability, our gross margins have expanded both YUI as well as sequentially with moderation in input prices and a most favorable portfolio mix in the domestic business. While we have passed on the benefits of lower input costs to the consumer, we have maintained the NP spend, which has grown on an 8% on a four-year CAGR basis, which we believe drive long-term growth and brand equity. Delving deeper into the India business, we shall touch upon the key trends in each of our categories and our strategy and outlook for the period ahead. Parachute had a strong quarter with a four-year volume CAGR at 6%, driven by a pickup in loose to branded conversion and penetration gains. As we envisage in the last quarter, we have started to see healthier trends in the branded coconut oil market after stability in copra and consumer prices were restored beginning December 22. Parachute widget gained 70 bits in volume market share during the quarter, with copra prices likely to remain in a comfortable zone in the near term. We expect volume growth in FY24 to track in line with medium term aspirations. The coconut oil market, a branded coconut oil and category, in future quarter four, turn back into positive, which is also a very good sign. Value-added hair oils delivered double-digit growth after subdued growth in the last five quarters. The category continues to be directionally in line with mass personal care categories, and we expect a gradual uptick in growth over the course of the year ahead. In fact, towards mid-quarter, it started turning positive, and even in March, we experienced positive category growth in value-added hair oils. Value growth in the value portfolio was in uh, mid single digits on a four year CIGR basis, lower than our medium term aspiration owing to the extended slowdown in rural and also some of the other issues which happened in terms of commoditization. While mid and premium segments continue to do fare better, 
with lower inflation and reduced proclivity of competition to commoditize the category, we expect the recovery in growth to be more broad-based. So, Solar Adegula are a soft quota, what went to a high volume base of in-home consumption last year. However, we continue to witness healthy offtake during the quarter. The brand has well delivered high single-digit volume growth on a four-year CAGR basis, which is in line with our aspiration. With stability trends persisting in the global veg oil market, we expect it to brand to be steady in the coming year. The food business has delivered a high team growth during the quarter and ended the year close to the 600 crore revenue mark. The oats portfolio continues to anchor the growth and maintain its strong leadership position with a 42% share. With while honey and soya chunks have been scaling up well, some of the new categories, namely mayonnaise, peanut butter, and munchies, have been beginning to get traction. We expect to cross 850 crores in top line in foods in FY24. This would be underpinned by expected buoyancy in urban consumption while we maintain steadfast focus on market development, brand building, food GTM expansion, and sustained innovation to extend our addressable market in the value added package field. Premium personal care has recovered smartly from the COVID lows with 40% growth this year. The portfolio closed just shy of the 350 crore revenue milestone and going forward, we aim to deliver a 20% plus growth consistently across the portfolio. And as you know that premium personal care is a high margin portfolio. The digital portfolio has been scaling up well in line our internal targets. The current portfolio is forced to reach ARR of 200 crores, exit ARR of 200 crores on next year, and this does not include any future acquisitions. Moving to the international business, we have delivered another stellar quarter with each market playing its part despite the macroeconomic situation and currency headwinds in some of markets. It is reflective of the robust business models of our international franchises. Bangladesh has been resilient as ever amidst external challenges, which is testament to our portfolio strength, distribution power, and consumer belief in our brands in the market, and of course, the quality of leadership. New portfolios of shampoo and baby care are gaining heft along the core portfolios. The Vietnam business further strengthened with both HPC and food delivering healthy growth. The integration of recently acquired brands in female personal care, purity, and olive has been completed. Mina delivered double-digit constant currency growth as a market that presents a sizable opportunity in terms of the addressable market share and top-line pool. South Africa and NCD business also continues on its strong growth journey. Looking ahead, I would like to draw your attention to slide 14 of our earnings presentation. Firstly, domestic volume has stayed well ahead of the sector and is poised to maintain an improving trend in FY24 in line with the sector. Revenue growth will inch up as the year progresses as pricing comes into the base in the latter half of FY24. We expect steady growth in our core categories of coconut oil, sapola edible oil, and vaho, with inflation, volatility subsiding, and price stability prevailing. Secondly, we have taken visible leaps in the diversification journey and the evolution of portfolio in the India business, which we began a few years ago, resulting in a healthy pace of growth. This is reflected in the share of revenues from your portfolios comprising of food, premium personal care, and digital first, which has seen a shift from 11% in FY22 to about 15% in FY23, and is likely to move to 20% of our domestic business in FY24, which means we have added an incremental top line of about 750 crores to these portfolios in a couple of years' time. With some of the food and digital service business have attained a certain scale, we will continue to drive accelerated growth as indicated earlier and focus significantly on improving the profitability in tandem. Once the shift of profitability is achieved, we will reallocate some of the resources to the core to drive market share while fortifying the long-term margin profile of the overall business. We have a track record of success in sports as far as foods is concerned. With the funding winter setting in and more sanity in the equation, we'll be able to improve profitability and leverage far more synergy while moving our digital first brand into the next leg of growth. On M&A front, we shall be constantly scouting for businesses which have a right to win in the respective categories and are syner synergistic to the overall Marico strategy. We will make sharp choices and refrain from venturing into fragmented and commoditized categories even if they give scale. Thirdly, in the international belief, we are present in a relatively unique mix of markets, the portfolio diversification efforts further insulate us from any concentration risk and ensure consistent in performance. You are aware that in FY20, we had a concentration risk of our business from Bangladesh and within Bangladesh, a concentration risk of PCNO. And therefore, we have had significant diversification in our portfolio and reduced this concentration risk to a large extent. 
We have proven that despite black swan events, we have a robust and profitable business model which enable us to avoid yo-yos and surprises in our international business. Last but not the least, we have maintained an uptrend in gross margins over the last two years, and we expect an uptick of another 200 to 250 bits YOY in FY24, keeping all factors constant, giving the cooling off in commodity inflation and portfolio mix normalizing favorably. As we have emphasized in the past, ANP investments will continue to be a key trust for our growth, as we believe that long-term brand building certainly is a much better choice over short-term profitability gains. Further, our focus on cost savings will continue and will be deployed to drive incremental growth. Owing to the above, we expect operating margins to move up by more than 100 bits year-on-year basis in FY24. We believe that we are moving in the right direction along the four strategic areas of diversification, distribution, digital, and diversity, and we are confident of delivering improvement across all the three parameters of volume, revenue, and earnings growth in FY24. We continue to make visible progress in our ESG program in each of our focus areas. Creating shared value for all remains the ingrained purpose of our business, and we will allow us to drive superior long-term performance. We are committed to achieving net zero emissions in our domestic operation by 2030 and global operation by 2040. Our ESG and other initiatives continue to get recognized in the various awards we have won in the last one year. With that, I will now close my comments. Thank you for your patient listening, and we'll now take your questions. Thank you very much. We will now begin the question and answer session. Anyone who wishes to ask a question may press star and one on their touchdown telephone. If you wish to remove yourself from the question queue, you may press star and two. Participants are requested to use handsets while asking a question. The first question is on the line of Abhi Mehta from Macquarie. Please go ahead. Hello. I'm yeah. all with Yeah, hi, yeah. sir. Sir, uh, I just wanted to kind of clarify on the margin expansion comment. Uh, you know, with the input cost, you know, more or less stable now, would it be fair to see the gross margin expansion more front-ended and the flow-through will probably be dependent over time? How do you see this during the year kind of panning out? This could give us some sense. Yes, Abhi, we believe that uh, gross margin expansion should happen right from uh, quarter one itself. Uh, although, given the kind of environment that we are operating in, while currently the commodity table has been stable, we would rather say that we should take it more from a two-year perspective, that at least we can expand by 250 basis points. And um, given the new product agenda that we have, we of course want to invest it back into uh, some of the products. And therefore, from the operating margin perspective, we are saying at least we should expand by 100 basis points. Fair point, sir. Fair. Just to add, I think, other than commodity gains, as I said, that now that our food and digital business has gone to scale, there will be a significant focus on improving their profitability. Okay. So that, okay, got it, sir. So that should be an additional kicker, if at all, and that is what will kind of take time to flow through as well. That could be it, the icing on the cake, if I may say. Yeah. Uh, so the second bit was on the, uh, you know, uh, sales growth front. Now, I understand your comment on pricing headwinds, but with, you know, parachute stabilizing uh, and actually back on the growth path, so polar optics improving, uh, volume growth rate should normalize to the uh, to our kind of steady state targets in the first half itself. It's just the pricing headwind. Is that understanding correct, sir? So I think uh, the best way to assume, that's why I'm just saying that I am unwilling to you know, give an idea of how will it pan from quarter to quarter because it's, you know, there's a base effect, there could be volatility. But mm -hmm. all I can say is that the we expect the volume growth mm -hmm. for next year, which is rather this year, is to be better than what it was last year. And therefore, on a full year basis, both on volume growth, revenue, and margins will be definitely better than what we delivered in this year. Got it, sir. Got it. Perfect, sir. I'll come back and look at the other question. Thank you very much. Sir. Yeah. Thank you. The next question is from the line of Vivek Maheshwari from Jeffries. Please go ahead. Hi, good evening, Sagata. Good evening, Pawan. Uh, a few questions. First, on Vaho, if I look at you know the the base for the next few quarters also remains low. So does that mean that you know uh, the base tailwind uh, will will help uh, and uh, the numbers for Vaho at least in the foreseeable future for the next three quarters or so will be like in double digits? 
So I think uh, the way to look at it, as I said, let's not go from quarter to quarter because uh, I think the best way to see is that I think it is a improving trend. And as I said, there are there are two factors. One, I think Bao, as you know, has a significant rural contribution. And given the fact there was a stress in the rural consumption and the fact that there was two things. One was significant food and retail inflation and commoditization by competition. I think all the factors have become more favorable. So all I can say is that the VAHO, again, uh, the number which is there, which will improve. Number two, I believe that the other change that will happen in the value-added hair oil market is that as a result of this, also that uh, last year, uh, the slightly premium brands, you know, which are, you know, a slightly higher 1 point, say 1.322 RPI, our brands and com that that sector was not performing well. I think that will start performing well and there will be a little more broad-based growth. As a result, I think not only we'll be witnessing value growth, and I believe we'll also continue to gain value share. Uh, just to, as I said, just to reinforce that uh, while in coconut oil, we saw some growth uh, category like that the pricing got right, the inflation was in control. In value-added hair oils also, towards the second half of the quarter, if I go a month basis, and definitely by March, the category came back into growth. Okay, and one follow-up, you know, if I look at between third and fourth quarter, last year or year before that also, the base was reasonably the same, uh, or, or there is no big disparity, but there is a, there is a big uptick in growth. Uh, would you attribute most of this to, you know, the industry trend or there were some self-help measures which also helped you, you know, uh, to, to have this kind of growth? No, no, so we have uh, grown ahead of industry, obviously, as I said, that uh, for a quarter basis, there was still a slight decline. I mean, it's less than, I think it's minus one, 0. 0. 0.7. So it's a slight decline. Uh, I think uh, what has happened is, as I said, that two things have happened that uh, I think relative... Uh, competitive commoditization you know, intensity in the commoditized part of the category has changed. Number two, obviously, some of our initiatives to gain value share have started picking up. And uh, I, I think also we see the rural consumption situation bottoming out. So it's a combination of external and internal, I would say. Okay, got it. Uh, second, Pavita, likewise, can you also comment on Safola? I mean, you have mentioned in your opening remarks, but can you just talk about uh, your outlook as we head into the next year? I mean, this quarter was obviously, there have been, you know, multiple pressures, but uh, how do you think this portfolio shapes up in X24? So I'll tell you first, uh, talking of this quarter, obviously the last year had first an Omicron base in January, where it was the peak of the Omicron, and therefore there was, in, you know, higher in-house in home consumption. Then when the Ukraine thing happened in anticipation of higher prices, I think in March there was far more retail pickup of stock. So it might not that growth which was there on the base was not necessarily off state base, but also people stocking more in anticipation there will be significant inflation. Now again on Safola, we give a yearly position that if, if the things are stable and not volatile, we should be able to give the a growth which is commensurate with our you know, medium term aspiration of, you know, mid, mid kind of a mid to high thing, we get growth kind of a thing is possible. Okay. And two industry level questions, if I may. One is, you know, your press release talks about the GT declined uh, a low single digit. If you take a, and, and of course you have spoken about e commerce and modern trade, if you take a medium term view, do you think that is how the business, the, the GT channel will shape up, or do you think GT will? Uh, will you know will will be an important one and will continue to grow uh, if you take a five seven years view. So I think even in a five seven years, GT will be an important uh, channel. So the reason there is a combination in GT is a combination of both things. One is that obviously if you look at last uh, compared to two years back, modern trade has you know done a smart recovery. Uh, in our case, as you see, a lot of innovation which we have done is digital and foods are very very urban centric and with a skew in modern trade and income. And GT has a significant portion of rural which under, underwent some consumption stress. So I think slowly, I would say GT will start recovering for the sector. Uh, now, I don't know about, you know, overall GT obviously has performed, uh, if I look at the FMCG sector, because of the rural bias, a slightly lower performance compared to MP and ecom. But all I can say that it is going through a transformation. And there is no substitute for 
direct rural distribution which will continue to be a source of competitive advantage for fmcg players and it will have a significant uh, what i call entry barrier for some of the players you know in b2 you know for a lot of b2c players uh, you know they have obviously a, you know advantage and capability of digital marketing but i think uh, when they get scale they move into gt compared to organized they have to face organized players and that is where they have a uh, organized players have a significant competitive advantage so in india it will be an and growth maybe the gt model will keep on changing in terms of consolidation and the way we do business there is a transformation happening but let me tell you the neighborhood kirana is very very critical they are here to stay they are smarter than a lot of other people and they are smarter than what we think and therefore i think uh, even if i look at a 2030 kind of a scenario gt will still be the majority in india got it and last question on the industry uh, you know nilsan fmcg volume growth what you have put out there so hpc turning you know uh, let's say flat to positive is a is a good thing but you know at the same time food is also accelerating so is it a simple case of sort of a lower penetration in case of food and therefore structural story is far better or there is some cyclicality between the two because you know the 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 per caps and penetrations of food has always been lower but in the last decade also there have been periods where hpc has done better than food and there have been periods where it has been vice versa what do you think is happening between the two here so let me tell you something uh, so there are two things one is it has a far more urban skew and also a little bit of top down uh, modern trade ecom skew uh, there is a significant uh, what i call conversion from unbranded to branded growth in packaged foods because penetration is low i think uh, there are also some trends in terms of health in terms of wellness and also the fact that healthy you know, snacking and i think uh, covid aided a lot of inform consumption and gave a lot of uh, you know philip to the foods category hpc has two issues going for one is the rural skew is far more and rural is where and hpc is far more secular across income classes and therefore whenever there is high food inflation and consumption stress hpc gets more impacted than food the second thing is some of the hpc categories obviously there is a uh, Uh, you know what i call higher penetration as a result of this high penetration a significant growth happens two factors one absolute population increase number two is premiumization and therefore whenever there is high inflation obviously the premiumization journey uh, undergoes a shift to downgradation and what we have seen number three i think the input cost pressure which has happened in hpc because of crude and other things has led to a lot of people managing as you know price points in hpc through shrink shrinkflation now what happens is that the rural consumer especially all at the bottom of pyramid they fix outlay and therefore whenever there is when you think that you have managed mlh and you will manage transaction people actually adjust consumption so i think it's a combination of all this and i believe that slowly hpc will come out of it having said that the long term perhaps the headroom or the runway for food is a slightly more than hpc got it thank you very much and uh, and i also want to thank you for you know incorporating some of the data points on slide 14 very useful you know couple of data points are really useful from fy24 perspective thank you and all the best thank you the next sure. question is from the line of prasi pantaki from ifl securities please go ahead uh hi uh, shagata just again uh, wanted to uh, do a deeper dive into the waho segment here so i was looking at the four year kgers here uh, bajaj consumer is uh, close to flat uh, dabar is a 1% uh, four year kger you are at a 4% uh, four year kger in waho so is there at all any kind of uh, uh, sort of a uh, pipeline or any kind of one off that we need to be aware of and if not uh, basically what has driven this i mean within waho uh, 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 was one or two brands suppressed which has come back to uh, full strength or what exactly is the story behind these numbers so i think as i said that uh, you have to look at two things one is if you look at we have been consistently gaining value share quarter after quarter uh number two as i said that actually the value uh, over a four year period uh, 
I think there have been instances, especially at least in out of two and a half to three years, and in the four years there has been COVID base also. So I think uh, the number two instance there has been, I think till December or even November, there has been a significant competitive intensity at the bottom of pyramid, where bottom of pyramid growth have happened. So the reason this value growth has also happened, as I said, is that we believe due to a combination of uh, that less focus or less intensity in the bottom of pyramid, number two is because of lower inflation leading to, I think the sum of the mid pyramid and the higher and uh, top of pyramid brands have started growing in the categories, okay? And there our participation is far higher. Our focus is, has been higher because we have been focusing on value share and that is the reason the value share has started growing. And uh, as I said, and, and in Marico, we don't normally, there is no adjustment that happens between primary and secondary. Normally, we keep broadly, you know, we constant. Right. So basically, uh, just to summarize, what you're saying is that out of this uh, uh, differential between, let's say, other players at 0 to 1 and you at 4, that 300 bits differential on 4-year Kager, mind you, it's a Kager, so that's like a 12% uh, or uh, yeah, 12% point-to-point -point kind of a differential. That is mainly mix only. It seems rather difficult to believe that, uh, Shogata. No, no, it's not a mix. It's a, it's a, it's a combination of, as I said, it's a combination of. We have a broader participation strategy, okay? Because if you see, the we also have had innovations in this space. Because as you know, there is Allo. We have just launched onion oil. We are now participating in mustard. So it's a combination of core growing, it's a combination, some of the new things growing, and the fact that we participate across price points, we have had a broad-based growth. And if you look at it, it see, it, it could be in certain players, all the growth have either happened in price point packs or the bottom of pyramid, and a decline in packs which are of higher, either higher, higher packs or higher RPI brands. So it's hmm. a combination of all of that. Okay. And uh, 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 do you think that? Me, I mean, I mean, there is. I mean, as I said, the four-year primary will be equal to four-year secondary. Yeah, yeah, that so, that point I got. I'm not doubting you on that. I'm just I trying mean, to find out the underlying drivers. Like, is it uh, Nihar Shanti Amla, which has grown uh, ahead, or is it uh, uh, these new aloe vera variants, etc., which have driven the growth? Okay, look okay, at Percy. Listen, we have five brands. Okay, so we have Shanti. Uh, we have Jasmine, we have Hair and Care, uh, we have uh, Nihar Perfume Coconut Oil, and we have Aloe. Okay. And now if you look at it, these brands operate between 0.7 to 1.6 in a RPI. Now it could be, as I said, I'm reinforcing so that you will get a better color to it. If I grow all across these brands from a 0.7 to 1.6 RPI versus somebody only growing at a lower RPI and declining and higher RPI, this difference happens, no? Right, right. So, so I got the point that you're gaining market share and you're doing better at the premium end versus other. So if you can just share as to what are the inputs you have put into the business and what you are doing differently versus competition that you are succeeding where they are not. No, no, I don't, I mean, I think it's about, I mean, I can't get into details we have a plan, we have to execute it well, and I don't think we are still happy what, what we are doing. We have to do better. Okay. Second question, Sagata, is on foods. Uh, 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 just correct me if I uh, heard you wrongly, but I think you said that uh, this year you are ending just shy of 600 crore, right? Around 600, yes. Okay. And you are targeting 850 next year. So that's like a 40 to 45% kind of uh, uh, value growth which I think is higher than the kind of value growth we have done this year. And this year was a pride of, uh, pr uh, pr year of general price inflation. Next year, in fact, on a YOI basis, the price inflation might not be much. So you don't the kick get the kicker from that, and you have to uh, deliver most of that 40, 45 through volume. So just wanted to understand what makes you confident of accelerating the volume growth to such a high level. Okay. <clears throat> First of all, let's put our perspective. We ended FY20 at 170. We have reached 600 in three years. I think it's a significant amount, and I think it is equal to a size of some of the small companies, and in fact, larger than some of the so-called, you know, some of the companies which we have in food, okay? Now, there has been a, if I look at the launches which are there, 
all the launches happened in quarter three and quarter four, and a lot of them have not uh, got scaled up. Number two, we started the food GPM, which is again from quarter three, where we are expanding into actually 10 to 12 thousand outlets with a separate sales force. So it's a combination of that, and I think whether we reach 840 or 850 or 860, I think the question will be that we would have added 700 crores, and you never know there could be some inorganic also. Sure, sure, got it, sir. But that's all. Uh, that's all from me. Thanks and all the best. Thank you. The next question is from the line of Kunal Vora from BNP Paribas. Please go ahead. Yeah, thanks for the opportunity. Uh, I wanted to understand about MTA and Ecom contribution is now almost one up to thirty percent. You mentioned that uh, GT will now recover. So how do we see this uh, mix uh, going forward? MTA and Ecom will continue to increase, or uh, there could be some reversal and. How do you see the higher uh, contribution of MT and Ecom uh, in the medium to longer term, considering that there is a high higher level of concentration and bargaining power of the buyers? Hello. So I think uh, it has also happened because of the kind of new launches we have done. If you look at foods, for example, we have a significant skew towards MT and Ecom. It is only now where we are expanding the GT. We hadn't because, as you know, that our GT was not aligned to a lot of you know food outlets. Number two is, uh, if I look at it, also some of the, um, especially the e-com growth was led by the tailwind. Uh, we we believe because of our acquisition of some of the digital brands, our digital marketing and e-com capability is perhaps leading edge in the industry. And this year, MT also recovered. And also some of the brands like Sephora and all have a natural this one. So I would say two things. One, I think we need to do a better job in GT. I believe uh, GT obviously has opportunities, and I think GT a lot of, as I said, the GT has suffered last year also because of two things. One is uh, the rural consumption, here. and number two is obviously in urban. What is happening is that because of the uh, growth in uh, you know modern trade, the GT distribution system is under stress and it's undergoing some transformation. So I think it would. So I would think that that's why I said that I think we need to uh, perhaps get GT back into growth, and I'm extremely confident that this year we will be growing in GT. And are you seeing a higher level of consolidation on the other side in MT and e-commerce, and uh, any uh, like impact on margins from that? So I think uh, one thing, as I said, that uh, we have to continuously innovate, and you have to be a number one and number two player. Uh, number two is I think. Uh, obviously, the cost of sale in e-com and modern trade could be higher, and therefore we have to continuously premiumize the portfolio. And thirdly, I talked about a significant focus on improving the profitability, or the you know in terms of cogs in cogs terms and other things in food, as well as digital, and that will neutralize this uh, increase in cost of sale which you are talking about. Okay, fine. Uh, second and last question: If you can talk about the macro situation in Bangladesh, a couple of quarters back, there were certain problems. Currency was depreciating, and also uh, along with that, how is the mix of business changing? Coconut, non coconut, and uh, the, how how do you see the growth rate going forward? So I think uh, whenever there is disruption, and history has shown the strong get stronger and the weak get weaker. In Bangladesh, our relative strength is significant. I believe we are. The top two, top three FMCG players in Bangladesh, in a relative sense, we are far more stronger in Bangladesh than that. And I think just not brands uh, or distribution or equity, I think we have extremely strong leadership. And one of the things we have done in the last five years, six years in the international business is a methodical way where we have now a playbook, which we are now replicating across Vietnam and Middle East, the Bangladesh playbook. Now, coming to Bangladesh macro situation, I think there is a combination of inflation, which is moderated a bit because as you know crude prices and overall vegetable prices and wheat prices across the world are moderated to compare what it was peak when the ukraine issue started uh, the devaluation has happened but again the devaluation we believe that it's uh, i think we have learned to manage the devaluation and uh, the third thing is that obviously we have continued our uh, diversification journey so today the dependence on, if you look at coconut oil, uh, dependence, parachute coconut oil, say four, five years ago, it was 90, it has moved now to 60, or even it will move back below 60. So we have done these three. So therefore, there is a, and we have continued to invest, even if the cause of inflation. Obviously, 
it's a tough situation but i think uh, as far as the bangladesh macros are concerned i think we have learned to live with it and i don't think it's deteriorating i think whatever shock happened has happened and i believe that we there is a stable government and uh, everything the situation will be i think uh, and a bangladesh economy and the way it is run i think it's pretty 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 good and therefore we believe that the bangladesh story and the bangladesh growth opportunity is very much intact okay that's very helpful thank you thank you the next question is from the line of sheila rati from morgan stanley please go ahead yeah thanks for taking my question uh, my question is partly answered uh, but let me uh, take it up again uh, with respect to the wahoo portfolio uh, sagata uh, what i understand based on your comments is that uh, uh, the growth has been much better broad based uh, we are kind of minimizing the portfolio uh, is it fair to believe that uh, we are shifting away from rural towards uh, more urban india and second is what kind of npds we have had in this portfolio uh, on a percentage basis and uh, is the distribution for the ncds as deep as our existing portfolio okay firstly i don't think there is a shift from rural to urban i think what what i am trying to say again is that if you look at the vaho growth uh, in the last i mean at least till december what happened a significant portion of the vaho growth was happening in price point packs at the 10 rupees 20 rupees and some of the brands like mustard and some of the other Uh, what i call uh, you know price warrior brands in the space okay now that uh, two things have changed one is that the first shift that happened was that uh, in november december so a lot of competition at least was not taking price increases in spite of a huge input cost but i guess because of other pressures competition was forced to take price increases that led to some what i and also uh, what happened in this category is that a lot of players other than us was that cut a lot of atl to btl and they were spending on btl now that has got reversed we continue to spell more on atl we believe in a long term atl story and that's why the growth in the other parts of the portfolio and the other than the price point packs has increased now coming to innovation i think the biggest one which we have launched in the last 4 years 4 5 years is aloe vera which has crossed 100 crores uh, we are just about taking onion oil to gt we believe that our right to win versus a d2c brand onion oil is a category which is now accepted it is reasonably salient our right to win in terms of pricing distribution ability to execute in gt is far higher than a d2c player uh, we we will also see some more launches we have also now entered uh, we were earlier you know compete trying to compete in mustard or sarso in a very me to product we now have a differentiated product and therefore you will see far more and you will see far more maybe one or two more innovation in value added hair oil as we move down in this uh, you know this year so i would say the it's a combination of that and i don't think there is any urban bias having said that i think we will also see a premiumized portfolio slowly which will come into place uh, and our focus i think we have a disproportionate share in modern trade and in ecom where uh, obviously there are players uh, which have far higher and have premium offerings which we need not play through our core franchise but through some of our digital brands for example and this is and just to follow up your uh, some god number here what would be the share of premium like portfolio now for us versus Say for five years ago. No, I don't want to get into numbers. Please. Okay. Uh, and my second and final question was uh, with respect to the food business. Uh, what would be the distribution reach for us uh, currently, and where do we aspire to take it say, in the next uh, uh, 12 months or 24 months? Food? You are talking about food? Yes. Yeah. So I think uh, obviously uh, in, in terms of i think car availability in ecom and modern trade is almost nearly there okay not so much for some of the new things like snacks and all which are launching as far as gt is concerned we believe that we are first focusing on uh, now if i look at uh, masala oats i think it reaches 1.8 lakhs no? 2 lakh outlets so that's uh, where masala oats which is the most distributed brand now what we are doing is 
we believe honey and soya are the ones which will first get mass distributed and then we will see snacks. Having said that, there will be a part of our portfolio which will not be an ATA driven portfolio. So we now have around 10,000 food GTM outlets, which are a lot of them are open format, you know, standalone outlets, which we will focus on and that number will slowly try to increase. Now you must realize that food has a lower shelf life, therefore supply chain, uh, replenishment, the way you sell foods in terms of frequency of billing is completely different from our core portfolio. And that's the capability we're trying to capture. So we are going about in a slightly more, you know, careful manner so that we don't, you know, we don't want to scale up high and then, you know, fall flat in terms of, you know, not being able to manage shelf life and other things. Understood. And uh, just one final point here is uh, uh, on the uh, new product launches side, uh, should we expect new, new product launches more on the personal care side or on the food side going in F24? We would like to launch both. I think in the last three years, obviously, uh, there has been much more this one on foods. But you will see some definitely prototypes in, in the personal care side, definitely. Because we have a premiumization agenda. Uh, our premium portfolio uh, is doing well. I think uh, most of them have gone back uh, higher than the pre-COVID levels. And therefore, we are, uh, you are going to see, I think, compared to the last three years where it has been far more food, you will see a much more balanced kind of a picture as far as innovation agenda is concerned. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. The next question is from the line of Akshin Tucker from Fertility. Please go ahead. Yeah. Uh, hi, Swagata. Congratulations on a good set of numbers. Just a couple of questions. Uh, on uh, Waho, uh, good to see you know, value growth come back to double digits here. Uh, just generally over the next two to three years, uh, not asking for a guidance is generally how you're thinking about that business in terms of growth aspirations over there. Uh, if you could share from next year, great, but definitely over the next two to three years, uh, what are your aspirations? What, what needs to happen for you to say it's a good job? That's question one. I had another question, but I'll wait for this answer. So I think uh, if rural comes back, there is, I think our aspiration is to get into a double digits and hit double digits. And I think there will be a little more broad based play. Uh, I believe that also there is now far more sanity in the category in terms of people growing brand through ATL and equity. So therefore, uh, I think our aspiration and we will I think there will be a significant focus area will be to hit a double digit growth in value in the next three years. Okay, great. And then on edible oil, just, uh, you know, there's... But just no, wanted food. to add, please don't hold us on every quarter. I mean, you have to look at... No, 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 no. That's why I said as a, as a broad, broad three years. As a broad yeah, three year yeah, guidance. Yeah, yeah. Because it's too volatile. I completely appreciate yeah, that. Yeah, yeah. Uh, on... on the edible oil business then, uh, you know, and that, that's a little more tactical and near-term question. Uh, the raw material pricing has been very volatile. Uh, you know, how are you managing it right now? You know, there have been times where we focused on volume share. There have been times where we focused on margins. Where are you on the pendulum right now? Uh, and Chandri, you know, if I can feel the onion on your comments around value growth, uh, is it more coming from edible oil or is it more coming from coconut oil where there is a pricing headwind? No, no, no. So, see, at the end of the day, and I think the approach to Safola is very clear that we will be continue to be competitive, pass on value to the consumer subject to a threshold level of margin. I think we will not definitely uh, go for volume growth which are not sustainable. Now, we have had situations in the past during COVID times, but that was because it was a tactical opportunity. But uh, I think going forward, we're absolutely clear that uh, we will maintain a threshold level of margin. As I said, that both the Safola and the food business, I think uh, margin expansion and uh, Safola is protection of margin and food margin expansion. This will be uh, some, I'm seeing our primary focus area. Okay, great. And a last housekeeping question, just on the employee cost side there seems to be a large bump this quarter. Was there anything one-off that you'd like to call out or is this part of a course? Actually, I think uh, for a fixed overhead line item, it's better to look at full year number. For a full year number, it's close at about 11%, which is a tad higher. 
So there are two reasons for that. Uh, one is uh, that some of the cost was not in the base for a couple of acquisitions that we did, which is two elements and uh, beauty action group fund. And second, there were some one-off reversals of management incentive in the base year due to some non-achievement of business targets. If you exclude them, then the growth will be about seven to eight percent, which is largely in line with the industry average. Okay, great. Thank you so much, and all the best for the next year. Thank you. The next question is from the line of Tejas Shah from Spark Capital. Please go ahead. Uh, hi, thanks for the opportunity, and uh, swagata congrats on the extension. Uh, a couple of questions from my side. Uh, uh, first, on uh, data days, if you see there is an expansion of data days, and if I try to correlate with the commentary that you spoke about that uh, modern trade and commerce have gained higher share, uh, is this an outcome of uh, that mixed change? And, and then if that's the case, then how should we see this trajectory going forward? You're right, uh, Tejas. Uh, some part of the increase in data days is a function of our contribution including some alternate channels. Uh, if you compare with last year, uh, same quarter, it's about 3 to 4% higher. So that's structural, I would say. But apart from that, uh, as you know, in our business, there's a deflation, right? So the revenue growth was not very, very healthy, and therefore, distributor had also ROI pressures. Even in GT, we have sort of given some additional selective credit. So that also has led to increase in uh, later days. But that's more temporary, and when the deflation gets into base and we start doing revenues uh, in the second half of the year, the credit extension, of course, will come down, and that will definitely. Uh, I believe that uh, going forward, you can expect there could be some reduction uh, from quarter to one. Sure. And and in terms of uh, private label strategy, we are seeing a lot of aggression from uh, national chains now in modern trade. So, I uh, what's your read on it? And, and so, I the BP touched upon it that uh, the the records could be. Uh, to gain market share and be uh, one of the top three in each category, but it won't be possible across, and especially with me pushing so many uh, NPDs to GT and uh, sorry MP and com. Uh, how do you think? Uh, how do you uh, strategize for private label aggression from uh, modern trade guys? So I think, as I said, that you know, if you look at modern trade globally, that where are you uh, vulnerable to private label? There are two things. One, depending on the category, for example, there are certain categories which have a higher proclivity towards private label. The second thing is, I think, uh, fortunately, we are number one or number two in more than 90% of the portfolio. Usually, the number three, number four guy gets squeezed. And the number three mantra for this is that you shouldn't make super normal profits in a category. So if you follow all this, I think you are less vulnerable and you should continue to innovate. I think if you follow all this, you are... Obviously, there is always a threat, but you can manage that threat so that it's not a, has a significant impact. Sure. And then last one, if I may, uh, so that for the last almost four or five years for industry, we have seen that Google growth has been volatile. Uh, it has, uh, there is some bump up and then again, we lose the momentum as an industry. Uh, so what's your read? Because uh, uh, if we step out of our sector and we see some of the other categories in consumption basket and otherwise, uh, the rural distress is not as high as we are kind of registering in our sector. So uh, do you think the wallet share change is impacting us more than, than the consumption slowdown or consumer slowdown that we have, we have been highlighting in the sector? So I think it's a combination of two things. One, I would say that our, you know, our usage or consumption is equal across population and income strata for most of the categories, okay? Secondly, most of the categories, especially in HPC, are well penetrated. And thirdly, in a lot of categories, the opportunity exists for the consumer to downgrade, which would not be always. In the case of other things, also the fourth thing is, in a lot of categories, discretionary, it's a question that brings you either a tad of joy or, a, you know, sometimes what happens you, it's a tad of luxury you want. While these are items of daily consumption, which you might say that I can have easily downgrade. So to give you an example, I think uh, as the, you know, as the thing opened up post-COVID, a lot of things like eating out or uh, traveling, all that are significantly increased and some with a vengeance. Now, after some time that will settle down. So I would think these are, these are perhaps uh, this one. And if I look at it, you know, uh, in a case of certain categories, you know, also there is a lot of unbranded people and move from branded to unbranded also. 
those opportunities yeah. don't exist when you buy a two wheeler or buy a refrigerator or go for a qsr i mean you can downgrade but there is a basic threshold thing there no fair point fair point and that's all from my side thank you the next question is from the line of ajay thakur from anand rathi please go ahead hi sir thanks for taking my question uh, just wanted to understand in terms of the new competition uh, you know coming in the parachute space or the coconut oil space how do we see uh, them shaping up given that you know they are kind of uh, you know playing more of the pricing game and i believe in certain aspect uh, you know the the category has some price sensitivity in that context see i think the best way to look at it how we are performing on market share i think uh, over the last 3 4 years have you know and lost market share so i think that's the best way to look at it and we also have flankers it's you know okay uh but do you believe that uh, you know given the size that they are right now and the kind of you know growth they are witnessing they can be kind of a threat uh, going forward to us in terms of the market share or we will have to start you know spending more behind the brand to kind of you know uh protect them or not be able to share what we want to do but all i can say is that you have to see that we will protect our market share whatever may happen we will protect it okay and okay, secondly uh, also also can you understand in terms of the edible oil uh, given the fact that uh, right now if i were to put across the pola uh, prices are kind of over indexed versus some of the other blends maybe something like a sunflower oil or uh, in the market so do you, that can that be you know kind of having some implication in terms of the volume growth aspiration for the current year for us again i said that i think we have to look at a long term aspiration for driving a mid single digit kind of a you know volume growth to a high single digit and uh, number two we keep a threshold on the profitability and we will not grow at any cost i think as prices come down uh, the you know the what i call people's willingness to upgrade becomes higher because they don't look at percentage but absolute rupees and sofola is a very very strong brand okay thanks thanks for that thank you the next question is from the line of abhijit kundu from anti stock broking please go ahead yeah hi uh, thanks for the opportunity uh, my question was primarily on your, you said that uh, march was a, the march uh, you got into a positive territory in terms of uh, rural growth uh, so how do you and, and you were saying that uh, you also said in one of your comments that uh, Uh, you are seeing bottoming out of uh, you know uh, rural slowdown and uh, improvement from there. Any uh, uh, you know uh, what do you call it? Any any instances or anything that makes you so confident uh, that uh, I mean uh, there is a bottoming out of uh, uh, rural slowdown? Uh, any instances of that? And secondly, uh, in terms of geographies, uh, you know coconut oil portfolio is more skewed towards uh, south east. uh west and uh, uh where the pain point anyways is not much uh, it's more in north and it's more in hsn uh so how how are you and where to what extent your value added here oil uh, uh, has some amount of uh, exposure uh, so in terms of geographies how have they panned out in the sense that uh, how has H- hsn panned out for you how has uh, in here so uh, how have, which are geographies have done well which geographies are now you uh, you you think that it will improve or uh, something or other in terms of geography in value added here i don't know what gives you the idea that hsm is not doing well and uh, south and west doing if you look at nilson i don't think there is any such you know skew maybe some people have not done well there in hsm but uh, you know i don't know about that uh, all i can say is that what i mentioned about rural growth in bahu is that if i look at the decline they have started improving quarter on quarter and we believe that uh, the in the in the quarter 4 the drop was around only minus 0.7% it was 3-4% decline which was in q3 so it's improved and even if you see jan feb march it is improving so therefore as i said that it's not about these numbers tell me that things are bottomed up now if these numbers change i can't help it because i can't really 
you know, it's very difficult to predict because ultimately it also depends on how monsoon pans out. But as of now, that is the situation. And I don't think there is this thing about, you know, this HSM or not is the problem and South and West doing well. I think the stress was reasonably everywhere. Okay. Understood. Understood. So that's, that's basically the numbers say that, uh, you see the numbers say that it's, yeah, and it's... Gradual it's a gradual improvement. I don't think it's like, I mean, as I said, that, that it's a gradual improvement and I think things should improve unless there's something happens on the monsoon. That's all. Okay, and, and the aspiration is that you should grow during the year or the year or two of when double digits in value. Always want to have aspire, go well, you know. Yeah. Thanks, thanks. Thanks for that. Thank you. Ladies and gentlemen, that was the last question for today. I would now like to hand the conference over to the management for closing comments. To conclude, while FY23 has been a year marked by a challenging operating environment, the improving trajectory of volume growth and profitability in the domestic business and the robust international business keeps us fairly optimistic of a better FY24 than FY23 on both revenues and bottom lines. The initial results of our diversification efforts in India and some of the overseas markets have been quite encouraging. We believe this sets us up for a sustainable and profitable growth in the medium and long term and in turn creates incremental value for all our stakeholders. If you have any further queries, please feel free to reach out to our IRT and they'll be happy to address it then. Thank you. Thank you. On behalf of Eco Limited, that concludes this conference. Thank you for joining us and you may now disconnect your line.